Baldur's Gate 3 review, I Cast Bullet by Maxor. This video is going to spoil the entire game. Baldur's Gate 3 is possibly the funniest game ever made, and I do not think it actually intends to be, because it's actually <laughs> trying to be really gay, taking yeah. place in a fantasy world where four adult friends are able to play on the same day. This game faithfully and hilariously recreates the D&D experience, all the way down to watching your friends paint the entire ground of their camp with your combustible blood, which uh, turns out can act as the fuse for a bomb. And that is just the beginning of the absolute insanity that this game has to offer. Because in the world of Baldur's Gate, anything is possible and everything is determined via dice roll. Yeah. And yes, that does determine whether or not you're going to be transformed into cats four turns before the building explodes. <laughs> I think this is the best game ever made, and I'm not even exaggerating. But before beginning our amazing adventures, we have to choose our characters very carefully. We've got Asterian, The Dark Urge, Squid Game <laughs> Huggy Wuggy, all the customization you can think of for my human male fighter. But today, we're going to be playing as Ongyat Riz King. I've oh my god, that is, this is very on brand for Max, or I'm already loving this. I think he brings up a lot of good points. Like this, I don't know if it's necessarily the best game ever. I think that's an incredibly subjective th statement to say. What I can say is that Baldur's Gate 3, a little, little hard for me by my own admission, but then again, I mean, I'm also a dingus. <laughs> if you have a very creative side, or if you play D&D on a regular basis, which I unfortunately have not been able to do because stuff always gets in the way and groups fall apart or groups never get able to meet up. Like if you play D and D consistently and you have a consistent friend group to play this with, you're in for an absolute treat. Baldur's Gate 3 has a very high fun skill ceiling, if that makes sense. They, them, wild magic sorcerer with absolutely unnatural charisma. Riz. Charisma is so powerful that I convinced the boss to kill his minions, to kill his dog, <laughs> to kill himself, <laughs> then convinced him to join me against the forces of Satan 30 hours after I sent him to hell. Coincidentally, Angyat Riz King is not a smart man. My playthrough was classified as morally ambiguous because I usually did the right thing very badly. You're probably wondering right about now, Maxor, why are you speaking to a sentient rat in hell? That is a good question with a very bad answer. I thought it would be really funny to sell my soul to Lucifer and then break into his house, kill his incubus that he uses to have sex with himself, steal my soul back along with everything worth money, which is the real reason that I'm here. Make a break for it just in time to get caught and be forced to kill Satan, who, by the way, has 666 HP and sings about how he's going to kill you like a Disney villain. Was this the ethical course of action? Maybe, but in retrospect, I did not think I would get caught. So honestly, and that's that's the thing in my playthroughs, uh, when I get up to this this encounter, Raphael, I just I, I'm always dubious. I'm like, nah, I'm not, I'm not signing anything with you. <laughs> but then you have people that are way more creative than me, way smarter than me, potentially even way more of a dingus than I am that can absolutely do that and finesse their way through the entire situation with an absolute profit. And it's always interesting for me to see that because like, think about it this way, we all play games differently, especially role-playing games like Baldur's Gate, like Dungeons and Dragons, like Shadowrunners, you know, uh, uh, GURPS, I guess, right? Or for just generic RPG stuff, right? There's a number of different ways that really anybody can play a game. And this thus has an increasing compounding effect where you have multiple people who are good at multiple different things and they interact in certain ways and multiple different potential solutions that they can go to. It's effectively a very fun statistics game, if that makes sense. And that's why games like this are so fascinating to me. Not necessarily that I'm good at them because I'm not. It's interesting to see how other people go about it, though. It's very interesting to see how they choose to approach it, how they solve it, sometimes in the most BS way possible. For instance, as somebody that loves Eldritch Blast, sometimes you just need to knock the hag off the edge with the knockback. <laughs> sometimes it just works. On top of his immaculate Riz and dubious ethical success, the most important detail of On God Riz King is that he is a wild magic sorcerer, which oh, no. is definitely a class to choose. Imagine for a moment that you and your 20 allies are trying to push past a narrow corridor when me and the fellas cast a swarm of bees, black tentacles, and a goopy fart cloud, which kills your entire team before you are able to see anything. I call this strategy the fucked up hentai. Now, if that was to hypothetically happen, you would theoretically accuse me of a lot of bullshit, to which I would respond with, yes, officer, I did just disintegrate that child. And what's more, I have committed crimes you can't even charge me for. 
Whatever. <laughs> Say hello to the spell Feign Death, which works by placing your allies into a coma. This, I would argue, is not a very useful spell. Uh -huh. But if I were to say, give all my money away to a lucky merchant, then he would trust me enough to initiate nap time. And after carefully concealing my presence in a conspicuous dark blob, <laughs> I will be able to steal my money back plus interest. And what's more, I get a fucking discount next time I show up. Is <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> Oh my god, that is oh that is that is some spice right there. Oh my god. That that's the stuff I miss about games. Like every game is concerned, and obviously rightly so, about we need to make sure this is a completely balanced experience and not exploitable, you know, coming from the days where Oblivion Infinite Arrow exploit existed, right? Like, God, sometimes sometimes you can break games super easy. But like that is such a game thing to happen though. Just you give all your money to a merchant to knock the merchant out. You hide yourself <laughs> with a completely conspicuous dark cloud. And then you just take it all back in that sum. <laughs> and because he didn't see you, you still get the discount. Oh, that gives me life. Combat requiring just a little too much thought. Are you perhaps getting tired of taking any damage? Then, my friend, look no further than the Globe of Invulnerability, which does exactly what you think it does a little too well. The only caveat being that the invulnerability happens to work on enemies, and they tend to see invulnerability as an advantage, yeah. meaning literally every fight that I use it in devolves into the funny friendship circle. <laughs> Say, for instance, that you were an enemy whose entire purpose is to explode yourself. If you happen to wander into the of comedy, you would be forced to unsuccessfully activate your bomb vest 20 times in a row, <laughs> hoping and praying for a death that I cannot provide you. Honestly, if you're creative enough, you don't even have to play most combat encounters. I once yeah. fought a boss that began every fight by instantly killing me. Now, most normal people in this situation would reload the game, try some other quests, literally anything that uses your brain. Yeah. But I am not normal people. I'm autistic. <laughs> How else do you think this video gets made? The neurotypicals couldn't do this shit. So instead... It's so true. Like, I'm not saying neurotypicals don't lack creativity or don't lack talent. I'm not saying that in any means. There is a certain spice that neurodivergency just, just, just gives you. There is. As somebody that is admittedly neurodivergent, there, there's just a certain spice to stuff I do. <laughs> we are going to cleverly sneak up on him with my entire party, then cast fear on him, forcing the man to flee while me and the fellows beat him to death with hammers. Another time, I was stuck in a difficult combat encounter with a invincible doom spider, at which point I transformed him into a more reasonable animal and forgot about him for the rest of the fight. Of course, magic doesn't always have to be used for combat or stealing. Sometimes it can be used for productive things like remote detonation. Imagine for a moment that you were tasked with solving a murder because the elephant police are being racist. Not against non-elephants, mind you, just immigrants. My guy is a, a reactionary rant soda. You would be able to quickly resolve this situation by performing necromancy and asking the murder victim who killed them. Alternatively, if I wanted to, say, kill everyone in the goblin camp without conventional methods, I could simply cast Speak with Animals and gently convince the local spiders to begin an erected race war. In fact, you can use this on any animal in the game, including threatening rats into revealing their cheese location, or the cat that narrates like a noir detective. Although I do think it is very strange that I don't have to cast it before speaking to gnomes. But honestly, out of all the magical items you can obtain in this game, my favorite was definitely the Gamer Sup's energy drinks, my because God. it gives my character enough energy to leap 50 feet through the air and take extra actions per turn. It uh, gets mailed to you as this cool alchemy powder so you can wow. save on gold and craft it into useful consumables. Gamer Sup's has all kinds of cool spells, like Grandpa's Ashes, Guacamole Gamer Part 9000, and my personal favorite, Lean. These are actual <laughs> flavor names. We're also working on getting you guys an official Max or Cup. Oh, this yes. is not the official Max or Cup. I would put boobs on it. But if you Please. want other cups with boobs on them, you can find the shop for them here in Description Alley, right next to <laughs> the subscribe store. And use code MAXOR for 10% off all spells. I am not responsible for what comes after. Look, all I'm saying is I've, I'm definitely a Gamer Subs Cups uh, customer. I, what, other, what other ones did I get? I got, oh, it was the Yonner's Cup. I got the Yonner's Cup back when that first launched. 
now have a Project Melody cup. If Maxwell releases a cup, well, I, I sure, I'll have to buy it, especially if there's Booba on the cup, right? I am a man of culture and class, after all. See, that's what he's talking about. Wizard! Let your ass open, dude. You can do the rump kicker, huh? Dude, this car kicks ass, and I can watch Madagascar while I'm driving. Ass. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> I just saw a wizarding duel outside Walgreens. One wizard cast a bullet at the other and stole his magical herbs. <laughs> Turns out Gale wasn't actually a crip. <laughs> or maybe now he is. Wizarding life truly is amazing out here in <laughs> Pennsylvania. Because when you join the Wild Magic Gang, you aren't just making a character. You're making a mistake. Yeah. Wild Magic Sorcerers have a random chance to select an effect from a list of 100. As long as you install the mod that adds 80. Every spell my character cast was a guarantee that something will happen, and whether or not I wanted that to happen is a different story entirely. Consider the- You have to understand, wild magic players are just built different. They are actually constructed in a different fashion because it really is that. It's you have, you cast thing. Grats, you have a chance of a thing to happen. Is it necessarily a thing you want? Who knows? It could be detrimental. It could be neutral. It could be beneficial to you. It could absolutely just nuke you in your party. <laughs> it could just win the encounter outright. You just don't know. And like, I think there's ways to mitigate that potentially. And it depends on how big the list is. It sounds like the base list is 20, which isn't bad, but adding it to a hundred. Oh my God. Like, uh, I think that's how one of the D and D editions that it might've been fourth ed that did it. I thought I'd have to look back at it, but like, it, it's so, it's so good. It, it kind of reminds me a little bit of dodge build from Payday 2, how you have a percent chance to just mitigate damage. So you're effectively just rolling the dice all game. I'm awful. My, my luck is actually awful, so I don't play dodge build for that reason. And it, keep playing Wild Magic Sorcerer would, would not be a good thing. Like That would be probably the most frustrating experience that I would ever play. <laughs> My luck is not good, but no, no, it go, yeah. Wild Magic players, Wild Magic mains are absolutely just on a different level. Scenario that you and your heroic party are desperately trying to escape an underwater prison. And no, this time it wasn't for bestiality. It was for hate crimes. You have five turns to escape before your character reenacts the Titanic. This is when you make the critical mistake of casting a spell, which yeah. triggers the random effect of lock all doors <laughs> magically transforming this exploding person into an exploding coffin that is a reload or how about the time that i was tasked with holding onto a torch under penalty of death whereupon the game decided that it would be really funny if i was banished to another dimension because it would be even funnier if i happened to reload the game and immediately get petrified okay look i am exaggerating a little bit here after all the chances of you transforming into an ovine on your third try it would be pretty low. Yeah. Of course, <laughs> wild magic doesn't always have to ruin the game. Sometimes it can do really helpful things, like permanently inflict my character with the clown curse, oh, no. which is, by every metric, an objective upgrade. <laughs> I had an emotional cutscene after I got this, and I'm sure it made everyone feel better. Here we have the fight with the giant robot where I accidentally transform myself into a cheese weasel. This gives God. us all kinds of new abilities like cheesy smell, what? which would be really good if uh, the robots could smell. <laughs> now, due to the obvious limitations of my class, Baldur's Gate 3 provides a myriad of options for customization, leveling, and companions, who, by the way, can be respected into any other class, making strategies like the four-man gambling squad and Jurassic Park completely <laughs> possible but not exactly viable. Wasn't it something that like, oh God, there was uh, one of the characters that you could respect into Monk and they absolutely hit like a freight train. Like, it's so cool to just have that level of creativity and freedom. And we've discussed it in other videos where it's when you give your players that freedom of creativity and that freedom to do what they want or freedom to respect as they were, you can still have it within the confines of the game, but still have a fun game where, you know, well this person is clearly a warrior, but we're just going to respect them into a monk, or this person is clearly a sorcerer, we're going to respect them into a thief, or I know, a Starion, actually. I'm pretty sure, doesn't he respect a monk fairly well because of his kit? Like, man, there it, you, you hit some silly, just some silliness, and it's absolutely awesome to just see that level of silliness and see the level of creativity that people can do in the game. I didn't even know Jurassic Park was a thing. 
I didn't even know. It's probably some druid shenanigans. <laughs> Trust the druids to make Jurassic Park. It's a thing. But uh, like, it's it's so cool to see this level of creativity and to see how, where people can bring these games. And really, modern gaming needs more of this. There's a lot of modern gaming that just forces you to stealth. There's a lot of modern gaming that forces you into specific things, that locks you out of activities because, well, you don't have this specific DLC or you don't have this specific expansion. And it's just not complete out of the box. And a lot of them are just minimum viable products. This out the gate was feature complete and then some. Personally, I find it completely bullshit that I do not get an intimidation bonus for walking into the bank with three fucking velociraptors. <laughs> like, do you see this very often? <laughs> so to get at the true heart of the Baldur's Gate 3 experience, we have to make some friends and eventually have sex with most of them. Yeah. Honestly, it's uh, pretty easy to forget that this game has combat. Personally though, I didn't get with any of them. Mostly because I can't show it, but also because <laughs> I was interested in a more Acquired taste. That's right, oh, baby. No. Gay sex with Squidward. I always <laughs> dreamed of touching those Squidward tentacles as I played his clarinet. Also, if you don't have sex with anyone human, the camp skeleton just insults you for having no bitches. And thus, thou art alone. <laughs> Shadow Heart, more affectionately referred to as Shart is a cleric of Char that I spent the entire game gaslighting into a religious fundamentalist. Then, as soon as that became slightly inconvenient, beat her to death with my entire party so badly that I could not revive the body for round two. Oh now, God. Shadowheart could have survived if I actually trusted her, but unfortunately, she is a white woman. What? And I don't trust the host. <laughs> Gail is an aggressively bisexual wizard with a nuclear bomb inside of his chest. And, uh... It wants me to feed it boots. Now, Gail claims this is because of his relationship with an actual goddess, but I don't believe him. Not because that's completely insane, but because I've seen how Gail behaves around me. <laughs> this motherfucker is gay. And since I've covered all this game's wacky and funny spells, I decided that I was going to respect Gail into a barbarian and give him a gun. This wizard may be out of spells, but he is not out of shells. Will is a daring and noble warlock who is constantly told what to do and treated like a dog by a demon girl. So I don't understand why he doesn't enjoy that. This game's writing is unrealistic. Lazel is a Githyanki fighter who, within three seconds of speaking to her, made me decide that yes, I am going to do a racist character today. <laughs> and over the course of our adventure, Lazel surprised and shocked me by uh, never failing to prove my racism correct. Asterion is a... Uh, <laughs> sorry, I forgot I installed that mod. Asterion is a devilishly handsome rogue that specializes in giving enemies the devious back shots. This is mostly because Asterion happens to be a literal vampire, which becomes relevant when I sacrifice 7,000 children to him to create the ultimate life form. <laughs> I promise this scene isn't gay. Unfortunately, this did basically nothing, as Asterion proceeded to walk down the hall and get his ass beat to death with hammers. Because out of all the abilities our sacrifice could have given us, Asterion had graciously received the power to continue being useless. Though, to be fair to Asterion, no ultimate vampire twink is going to kill five full-blood Texans on their fifth medella. And Karlak is a very hot barbarian that I use throughout the game as a punching bag. One time, Karlak got so mad that she randomly destroyed every box in a 10 meter radius, repeatedly setting the entire party on fire until we fucking died. It was- That was actually my experience. That was, I think that was the first encounter that you actually have Karlak with you. And it's, it's the paladins up the hill, right? And that encounter, I don't know what, it's because they have more rounds per action than you do on level. And so that was just an incredibly weird encounter for me to do. And the one time I was able to actually do it, and I, I did it on stream, uh, she proceeded to do this and I couldn't move. <laughs> I couldn't do anything while she was doing this. I don't know what it was. I think it was uh, stunned or something. And she just completely just, just team wiped the party. And I'm just like, I'm good. And I had to keep reloading, but eventually <laughs> I think the game just destabilized itself at that point because the game actually hard crashed. <laughs> So I haven't really forgiven Carlac for that yet. No, this is just par for the course for her. Sometimes she gets angry. Sometimes she gets spicy. Sometimes she just does things like that. Sometimes it costs a party weight. <laughs> but you see how each of these characters just has their own thing. They have their own shtick. They have their own personality. Where many other RPGs and many other games by extension as well just have these vanilla 
cardboard cutout characters that have a you know a plot line as, as deep as a tide cup right you know a little cup on top of the the, the detergent right the, and they're just super shallow they're super cut just they're not worth it like why should i care and the fact that what Baldur's gate 3 does very well is it makes you care about these characters where Carlock is a very interesting story where you have Asterion who, yes, he, he tries to bite you in the middle of the night, but he, you know, getting into explaining, you know, well, I don't want to go back here. I don't want to go back to Baldur's Gate because, you know, uh, vampirism stuff, right? And it, it makes you care about these characters. As it turns out, people like good writing. And when you just force feed them just subpar or awful writing over a period of years, and something like this comes out, it's a, it's a masterpiece. And it really is good writing. And am I saying that, it, that all the bad writing is making this seem like a masterpiece? Not necessarily. It is great writing. And, you know, it could be considered a masterpiece in its own right. Modern gaming needs more of this. RPGs, especially modern RPGs, should be looking at... I almost said Final Fantasy fourteen. Should be looking at Baldur's Gate 3 and saying, what did they do right? Rather than continuing their current course of action. The more they continue their current course of action, the more it's just going to make people play Baldur's Gate 3, to make mods for Baldur's Gate 3, to make custom campaigns for Baldur's Gate 3, especially if you have some kind of creation kit that ends up coming out for it, right? And it really is unfortunate that Wizards of the Coast laid off a bunch of people right after this one game of the year. And it shows just how unsustainable and out of touch a lot of the AAA industry is. This is an absolute masterpiece of a game, something we haven't seen in in any capacity in years. And it still gets bought by the AAA industry. It still just doesn't make the cut, or at least the, the staff members that worked on it don't make the cut. And it really is tragic. And then obviously you have the uh, alleged lawsuits that are coming against this game from larger studios. I think Ubisoft was humming that potentially. Uh, because it makes all their games look bad. That's like if if you guys in chat were all selling your own, uh, you were all selling your own game console, right? But they were all buggy and stuff like that. And you know, you were like, "Well, I just kind of cobbled this together, and it functions, right? It can play stuff." And then I come out with, say, a a console that is next gen by comparison, and it plays games. It's seamless. It functions, right? And then everyone just collectively sues me, saying, "Well, you make us look bad. How about?" you make a quality product and not make minimum viable products. And this goes back in relation to modern AAA industry. It's very great. And you have videos like this that spawn from it, where you have an entire video that showcases the absolute jankiness and creativity of the game. And I mean, jankiness in the best, in, in the best sense. And it's so different than what a lot of modern games are. We need more of this. This moment, I decided that Carlac was going to be the one to disarm every trap in the game for me. Yeah. Make sure to grab the treasures, Carlac. With our powers combined, we are the uh, t world's shittiest polycule. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> We're having so much fun without Shadowheart. <laughs> so, as the world's shittiest polycule, it naturally falls to us to combat the forces of Big Straight and stop the Squidward Ethnostate. <laughs> Mostly by accident, because if there's one thing that motivates me more than protecting my potential investments, yeah. it is stealing from them. <laughs> yes, sir, it is certainly bad if the only bank in the city gets robbed. But don't worry, I've conducted a thorough investigation in my camp, <laughs> and I have found no evidence of wrongdoing. Quests in Baldur's Gate 3 are, for lack of a better term, fucking insane, yeah. both in their scope and in content. Mostly the content. With I mean, early game, you have the whole hag thing, right? You go into the swamp, and you're like, wow, I'm taking some weird damage from the swamp, and then you're able to either perception dispel or eventually the swamp just reveals itself to you instead of being this this nice little swamp it ends up being this just awful putrid bog with a bunch of red caps in it right and then you know this hag ends up you know shape shifting into her actual form and then you have to go through the whole ha uh, the the whole basement and then you get to this tree that doesn't want to let you through because the hag's going to torture the tree even more which the tree used to be a person there's a lot of really messed up stuff in the hag's hut especially the basement and then you have to go through this whole section where i have to jankily jump past traps and stuff <laughs> well you can throw barrels and stuff over the the crates to make sure or over the, the vents to make sure the poison fog is dispelled and then you have to jump down some tiers and then you actually fight the hag at the end where you have to rescue what's her face and like this turn it what seems like a completely benign thing 
turns into a whole ordeal. And it's it's very interesting because there are games like Final Fantasy XIV, which is a, I would argue, RPG first, MMO second, but it is an MMO RPG. And I like that a lot of the quests are short. I really do. They're short. They're snappy. I can have a holiday event every month or two, and I know this just going to take me maybe half hour max, right? And or MSQ, right? I'm not necessarily go to this person, start the quest, go grab, t- <laughs> go grab t- 10 bear hides, go to the other person. Person says, ah, well, I forgot my forgot my, my wine chalice at this place. Go, Then you have to go there and you have to go grab the wine chalice. Then you get ambushed by a, a, a big bear and then you have to get right stuff. And it's stuff like that that make me like the short snappy quest. But here in Baldur's Gate, where they have a lot of substance, and they're unique and they have a lot of detail with them. And one thing leads to another naturally and organically. I think that's the difference. So I don't think it's necessarily that you know, long quests are bad. You know, long quest does not necessarily equal bad. Short quest does not necessarily equal bad. It's the quality of the quest. And honestly, sometimes all it takes is talk to person, go to place, talk to other person. You have all the context you need with cutscenes, dialogue, etc. Final Fantasy XIV does this very, very well, especially in an MMO type setting and, or format, I should say. And you get something like Baldur's Gate where, yeah, you have the whole hag sequence and it's super cool because one thing flows into the other. There's a bunch of environmental detail that you can choose to engage with or not choose to engage with, like the dude in the mirror, right? And, or the dude that was petrified. And you it, it brings you in these twists and turns, and you have a bunch of enemies that ambush you in the next room, and this whole jumping puzzle sequence, a bunch of toxin, uh, toxic clouds, and it flows together so well that it is an experience, in and out 20-minute adventure kind of thing. Like It is a whole experience to go through. And the quality of it is just completely next level that other modern games, I'm just kind of like... like go, <laughs> Not necessarily the same genre, but kind of adjacent. Destiny 2, right? Oh, God. Did I finish this step of the quest yet? Oh, my God. No, I didn't finish the step of the quest. Or oh, how, do I get, how do I do this again? Oh, well, I'm on quest 5 out of 9. Oh, this kind of sucks. It, it, where, when a quest feels more tedious than enjoyable, you start running into problems with your audience. The fact that these quests are longer but enjoyable hits a nice sweet spot. Multiple contingencies for failure, partial success, or the classic unrestricted Japanese war crimes. <laughs> Truly, the sky is the limit in Baldur's Gate. And the only thing preventing you from achieving your dreams are the consequences of your actions. Yeah. If, for instance, you were to ride the calamari carousel, no! a future character will roast you for your crimes against God in front of your friends. <laughs> your choices matter in Baldur's Gate 3. One time, I decided to visit the circus so I could piss off the local genie so badly that he sends me to Jurassic Park. But uh, that's not important right now. Exploring the non-insane part of the circus, we find ourselves enraptured by the performance of Dribbles the Clown. The oh, no. only problem being that while investigating a series of murders by shapeshifters, I had already met Dribbles the Clown and oh, I was no. carrying his severed torso <laughs> in my inventory. <laughs> Safekeeping. So despite knowing the identity of my gang stalkers, I decided to send a stereo to the stage anyways, mainly because I thought it would be funny. <laughs> and I was not disappointed. <laughs> this guy should open a YouTube channel where he promotes an energy drink he intentionally poisons. Now, you're gonna wanna be careful after doing this quest because unbeknownst to you, one of your crewmates has been replaced by an imposter. Sucks and Amogus. worst of all, I am kind of into this. <laughs> Can you shapeshift yourself pregnant? <laughs> so whether you know it or not, you are going to be playing Among Us for the next 10 hours. And honestly, playing as the imposter is so much more fun. Which is why, instead of stopping the killings, I decided that I was going to do them myself and eventually join the blood cults by bathing in the blood of the racist elephant to bring about a new future of crimson despair. Shapeshifters are usually multiracial, by definition, yeah. what I'm trying to say with these long anecdotes is that you never just go to the circus in this game or, God forbid, speak to a clown. Yeah. Though you are watching this YouTube video, which is close. Yeah. Repost if you want to. So I think that's the part also about Baldur's Gate 3 that resonates with a lot of players is your choices do matter. Where how many times in a game do you have a choice of one, two, three, et cetera? Yeah, wait, wait, not one, two, three, four, et cetera options. How many times do you have a set of options and you click a thing 
and it's effectively the same outcome each time. So, for example, if you're talking to somebody and you're uh, you're talking to him about his maybe recently deceased wife or whatever, and you know there's an option that's like I'm sorry to hear that, or you know, well, you could do better, or you know, I never really liked her in the first place. But all three lead to the same variation with the NPC responding, and well, I, I do miss her, right? How it feels like your choice doesn't matter. How like you don't the world doesn't feel like it acknowledges you. And I kind of ran into this issue with Final Fantasy XIV a little bit, where Xenos, one of my absolute favorite characters in the game, and probably transcending that game as well, he is an absolute unit. And so far, I've, I've, you have to see where Shadowbringers brings him. But there was a, there was a, a scene during Stormblood, and it came down to, uh, I reject you or I accept you, and that's all the context I will give you. People who have played fourteen know exactly what I'm talking about. And I did one option during my streams and I did the other option off screen because I was just kind of curious what the other option was. And they effectively led to the same option of just like, you know, will you accept me paragraph and uh, however we must do this or you reject me paragraph and how I rejected him. We must do this and doing this is the exact same thing. Your choices don't really matter. It kind of gives you that illusion of your character and characterizing your own path, choosing your own path and how you interact with things, but doesn't necessarily have a bearing on the actual story. And so it's things like that that come across as hollow to a lot of players. So it's very refreshing to see a game in which you talk to a circus clown and then you're playing Among Us for the next 10 hours or... <laughs> You, you choose to let something live or not live, and that has consequences down the line, as realistically you would expect. It's very refreshing to see these kinds of things, and more games need to have this kind of thing. Should every game? Not necessarily. I mean, I don't think it'd be, I don't think it'd be super in-setting. I think it'd be out of place from the like Call of Duty campaign, right? And But, uh, you know, in other games, RPG specifically, there could be something cool where, say it's like a fallout kind of game right fallout style survival type game and uh you choose to not side with a specific faction or you choose to side with a specific faction and if you didn't side with them they end up just just raising an entire town to the ground but if you did side with them and that you you can cast their plan early where you did try to raise they did try to raise uh their whole that whole town to the ground but you can speech your way through trying to stop it and if you fail they just gank you or if you succeed grats you save an entire settlement and i think that kind of goes back to potentially Really, I guess, Elder Scrolls for Oblivion, where you could kind of just do everything. And, and as somebody that likes games like that, where I'm not locked out of content and I can only do one thing per playthrough, right? Where you go into the Mages Guild, then you go into the Thieves Guild, then you go into the Dark Brotherhood, and then you go into the Th uh, Warriors Guild, and you go to the arena, right? You can do all of them on the same character to achievement hunt better. It also kind of suspends your disbelief where this one person is now everything, which canonically I don't think is technically true because it depends on your character i think and that gets into the whole elder scrolls is weird we're just gonna leave it at that but i think that's kind of set the tone for a lot of modern games and where it makes achievement hunting better and it saves people a lot of time but you're able to do everything and thus discoverability and stuff being locked behind certain avenues like that isn't necessarily a thing i don't know i guess i guess what is i guess what public perception that would be because oblivion skyrim both do it you can do all the factions but in something like I just mentioned with a certain faction trying to raise a city to the ground and it, you know, having long lasting consequences like Baldur's Gate does, I think there could be a game there. Mail a porcupine to your neighbor's box. Give me the thug saber, dude. Shake your ass. Take your hands off it and shake that dude. <laughs> 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 <Not even. laughs> Welcome to the first major dungeon of the game, appropriately named Central London. Oh and God. like the actual London, it is unfortunately filled with the English, you can uh, really tell because you can't understand anyone and the food is inedible. It is here that Baldur's Gate really shines as a game where you can do almost anything and an unlucky developer will be forced to code it. There are three targets for you to kill in the goblin camp, or if you're bad enough, several dozen, each with their own personalities, weaknesses, and premium cheese strategies. Needless to say, uh, this channel is not going to offer you any good advice. No. After all, there's a lot of guide videos for this game alongside race tier lists. So while I'm not going to be sorting you by phenotype, what I can give you is a taste of the premium cheddar. Okay, so you're gonna want to start out by uh, going invisible and placing a wyvern toxin into the Kool-Aid. Then Amazing. lead a toast by declaring that we are going to drink 
until we die. Make sure that Asterion is the one to do it, by the way. We don't need him anymore. Heading inside. We take care of our first... Speaking of oblivion. ...target by following her to a secluded location, summoning a cloud of daggers, and then initiating verbal exchange, locking her into our conversation while she is slowly stabbed to death. This isn't considered a crime, by the way, because... That's so genius, though. Oh, my God, because the animation locks them, but they're still taking damage over time. That is brilliant. Well, they can just walk out. Just don't hit a piece of wood while you're doing that, because then you're not going to be killed for assault. You're going to be killed for destruction of property. <laughs> the next trick we're going to do is called Minthara Skip, because we are going to be summoning a random spectator to skip to the end of Minthara's life. Just pray to God that she doesn't go down easily, because uh, the spectator certainly won't. Yeah. Finally, we have our third target, Dror Razglin, who is slightly hard to kill the conventional way. So instead of that, we're going to do something significantly harder. I know, really original strategy, Max. Those animals are so fucking funny! <laughs> Welcome to the Underdark, home of the, uh, spectator boss fight. Because yes, in addition to having a giant underground area filled with interesting flora and fauna, Baldur's Gate 3 dares to ask the question of what if people in the Underdark had a different skin color to me? And completely unrelated to that, what if there was a lot of slavery? My because God. it is this very slavery that we are going to take advantage of. Immediately upon entering the world's basement, you're gonna want to head over to the uh, Mushroom Kingdom. And uh, you're gonna get a letter telling you that the princess is now a permanent guest at one of Bowser's seven Koopa hotels. Talking to the giant mushroom, you're gonna have to explain to him how reanimating the bodies of dead velociraptors is technically not a war crime. But what I'm going to use them for is definitely a war crime. And after playing a game of Pokemon with the corpses that your enemies reanimated, we steal their boats and progress down the river towards the Iron Fortress of Grimforge. This place fucking sucks dick, I'm gonna kill myself. Welcome to Grimforge, home to many different kinds of people, whether they're enslaved or enslaving. You uh, really only have two options here in the Grimforge. Eavesdropping in on the local Minecraft Let's Play. We overhear rumors of an ancient and powerful explosive, which will purchase my child labor at least 30 minutes of Roblox time. And after gently ascertaining the location from their bodies, we carefully confiscate the nuclear weapon using a refined negotiation tactic where I lie to them. Now equipped with the most powerful bomb in the game, we are presented with a choice. We can either use this bomb to help the gnome slaves finally achieve their freedom, or we can use it to kill Jor Rasklin. So, uh, going back to the goblin camp, we discover through some experimentation that Jor Rasklin doesn't actually die to the bomb that I just placed. So, uh, into the hole you go, I guess. And that is how you quickly and efficiently speedrun the goblin camp. Make sure to subscribe for more uh, convenient time saves. Peter, what are you doing? <laughs> what the fuck? Okay, so the point I'm trying to get across, uh, really badly, is that this game is utterly massive, and it absolutely does not stop you from destroying it. Because in Baldur's Gate 3, every single mistake you can possibly make is going to come up again. And uh, most of the time, it is in the form- I haven't finished this. The hag comes up later. Of course she does. That makes a lot of sense. Oh, I'm not looking forward to that. ...of racial conflict. For instance, do you want to be a good Samaritan and free the Deep Gnomes from their unjust imprisonment? Well, congratulations. You just happened to free the Deep Gnome Clan's Grand Wizard. <laughs> Hope you're ready for a race war in 20 hours. Because uh, if you happen to misplace a certain bomb, then uh, he's going to happen to make Hiroshima look like a fucking joke. <laughs> Personally, this kind of stuff is the funniest shit I've ever seen. Not the racism part, although... That is still funny, but rather the simple joy of knowing that your save file has probably already been destroyed without you even knowing it. Yeah. Since beginning the long process of making this video, I have made a multiplayer warlock named Risley Bear, <laughs> alongside my friends Reese and Nomer Simpson. And after playing for approximately 10 minutes, I can confirm that my first character inadvertently killed almost everyone he spoke to, and about half the time, the reverse was true. A good example of this is the time that I just so happened to wander my character into a literal god, who then offered me a pivotal and important quest, prompting me to raise the reasonable inquiry that if she was a god, surely she would be able to kill anyone she wanted.
She responded by fucking vaporizing me. <laughs> Overall, this is, in every sense of the word, a role-playing game. Provided, of course, you want to role-play as a uh, dumbass murder goblin. Otherwise, uh, why do you even play video games? We yeah. blow shit up in this motherfucker. <laughs> Better take your sensitive ass back to LinkedIn. <laughs> With scores of amazing and deep content that I unintentionally locked myself out of because we accidentally killed a man named Bingus Bongus. <laughs> Ripped to a fucking real one. A strategic and complicated combat, and an entire world of possibilities and solutions, which will leave you wondering how the fuck yeah. am I allowed to do this? Yes. Is this a glitch or intended behavior? Yes. So, while I didn't get to cover everything, since uh, I'm only human, you can trust me when I say that there is something in this game for everybody. 10 out of 10 would unleash Noma Hitler again. For me though, I would like to thank all of my amazing patrons, using and sacrificing their funding for only the finest of video game content. As always, more deranged gacha game videos to come. I will be sure to spend all of your money very responsibly. Oh yeah, uh, this video is about Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> This video went way too hard. I absolutely loved this. This was quite an experience, if I uh, do say so myself. First off, if you have not checked out Maxor, go ahead and check out Maxor. He puts out amazing work. His work isn't necessarily consistent, if that makes sense. And when I say that, I mean he kind of uploads similar to uh, how JonTron used to upload. But that's not necessarily negative. What I can say is that he does put out a lot of time and effort into his videos and they clearly speak for themselves. I mean, we have what Nuxtaku up here <laughs> reacting to, I don't know why rule 34 is in there, but you know what? Fair enough. And uh, at this point, uh, you know, we're a little under uh, Nux's reaction, but uh, it, this was an interesting video. This was amazing. If you have not checked out Maxor, please go ahead and check out Maxor. Amazing creator, puts out a lot of great work and really, someone I look up to as somebody that just doesn't have the skill, in my opinion, to do edited content. It just seeing what they do and seeing the difference that they're making on YouTube and seeing how popular they are, not necessarily just from a popular standpoint, but just in my opinion, they're making a difference and the, he's doing a very, very good job with it. But what are your thoughts? What are your experiences with Baldur's Gate 3? Do you think that there's uh, something here for everybody, like he says? Do you think that people like me who are an absolute dingus may have issues struggling through the game? Do you know uh, some of the quests I'm talking about? What are your solutions to some of the puzzles? All that fun stuff. Let me know in the comment section down below. Thank you for watching, as always. I'll see you all in the next one.